Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. Uh, we're going to try to finish Philemon today. I doubt we do that, so, uh, but I'll get us close to the end, and I think that by next week we'll, we will have finished this little gem of an epistle. So I want to thank you for joining us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to come together and feast together on your word. We just thank you so much, Lord, that you have become our kinsman redeemer, that you have you died in our place that we may become the righteousness of God in you. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, carnal, that which is ignorant, and just seal to our hearts the truth of your word. Filter out all of the foolishness. Seal only the truth of your word to our heart that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We are studying together the epistle to Philemon verse by verse, and uh, in our last study, uh, there's only one chapter, uh, we were somewhere in the area of verse uh, 18. Onesimus is a slave who belonged to Philemon. He fled, whether or not he robbed Philemon is, is a matter of argument. I have no idea. There are two first class conditions in verses 17 and 18 that, uh, at least in verse 18, seem to indicate that he's wrong to Philemon. So, uh, in, with somewhat of a review here, uh, he's been made to flee by God. That's an heiress passive, uh, which put him under the death penalty. The Lord arranged Paul and Onesimus uh, be together in Rome and reveal to Onesimus that he belongs to God, that he's a gift from God the Father to God the Son, and we are looking at a wonderful picture of our redemption. And Paul is now used by the Holy Spirit to write this epistle to Philemon in behalf as, as a mediator for, for Onesimus. Now, I believe those to be the facts historically, and I find in studying much of the literature that, uh, uh, that this epistle, more than any other, has been used as a sounding board, somewhat of a, a battleground against slavery, and that may be. I have no doubt that uh, those are the facts of the story that these things actually happened in history, uh, that our God is a God of history, but I do believe that there is a much greater message in this little letter than meets the eye. Much greater message than just the account of Onesimus' transgression and the appeals made by Paul, because we tr transgressed against God. We've tried to look at those uh, because I believe there's a deep spiritual message in that. And we've seen that the appeal is made for Onesimus on the basis of work done, that which Paul had done, and in the greater light uh, in the message for us, our mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he can base that mediation on his finished work. Jesus prayed in John 17 that I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And I think that an, an enlightening Bible study for any student of Scripture is to examine critically this word to find out what Christ was sent to do. To, and that was to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel uh, to seek and, and to save the lost 
that includes the Gentiles, to deliver his people from their sins. Did he do those things? Did he, did he do those things? Did he fulfill the law? Did he take us out from under law? Well, he declared in John chapter 17, I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. And as he hung on the cross, some of his last words were, it is finished. That's why we can read in Hebrews that he died unto sin once and only once. That, in fact, was one of the great arguments of the Reformation. Does Christ die again in the Eucharist? No. He died unto sin only, uh, once and only once. To suggest that Christ must die again is to suggest that Christ did not do enough that He provided an incomplete sacrifice, that His work was insufficient. One of the great arguments of the epistle to the Hebrews, beginning in the ninth chapter, is that the priest, under the Old Covenant, ministered sacrifices day after day after day, never ever to quit, and every person that brought a sacrifice had to realize that he's going to bring another one and another one and another and another and another. And that there's never any end to this sin mess. Even when the high priest made atonement for the sins of the people, they realized that though he did this once a year, he's going to do it next year. And he's going to do it the year after that. And the year after that. And the message should have been as clear as crystal to any Jew that that doesn't work. And so we read in Hebrews, it is obvious that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, else they would have ceased to be offered says the text. What is he saying? He's saying that the sacrifice of Christ did take away sin and therefore is never re-offered. It's not to be repeated. And now we have a beautiful picture of the communication between God the Father and God the Son and we looked at it a little bit last week, the amazing grace, receive Him as though He were me. And dearly beloved, our lives are hid in Christ with God. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The appeal is not just that we be received, but that we be received as Christ. And that means righteous. The law, dearly beloved, the law was not made for a righteous man. It is the old man who sinned and who messes up your walk. But your new creation is righteous as Christ. Receive Him as Myself. If he's done any wrong at all, put that on my account. But what does that remind you of? Where did we ever get the pagan idea that Christ only bore our past sins? It should be intuitively obvious to every one of us that we had no past sins when Christ died. What we need to realize is that the sacrifice of Christ was so infinite that we became the righteousness of God in Him. I had someone tell me the other day, Adam was righteous. Absolutely not. He was innocent, and he wasn't righteous until God made him righteous. But we, you and I, have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. That is how you stand before God. 
That's your position in Christ. Any possible debt has been paid. It isn't just that He forgave our old sins, but He credited to our account His own infinite righteousness. Now these are difficult concepts for the average Christian to grasp because he just doesn't feel righteous. And of course, you know, we don't go by our feelings. The Word of God declares you to be holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Steve, I don't feel that way. You know, and you look in the mirror and you know it isn't true. Probably the people who believe they're sinning the least are sinning the most. So many Christians cannot seem, they, it just seems they cannot comprehend grace. Ministers yell at Christians trying to get them to live the way that they think Christians ought to live. Though there are exhortations to you and to me as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, this book, dearly beloved, this book is primarily a revelation of what God has done for us, not what we are to do for God. What we do for God is based upon our realization of what God has done for us. What do we think when we hear the Lord Jesus Christ say, Simon, who do you think loves me the most? And the man was forced to say, I suppose he who has been forgiven the most. Grace is a devastating concept. And it staggers my mind to hear Christians say, well, Steve, Steve, if I believed that, I could just sin all I want to, and it wouldn't make any difference. How can it be that, that you can look at someone who loved you so much that he died in your place and profess that you love him and then not care whether you please him or not? And yet there is the... Pre prevalent conviction that the chains of law will force you to live a better life than the constraint of love. I say no. I say that the strongest chain that you know is the love of God. Just to know that God loves me. It devastates me to act against that love. He loved me so much, He bought me. Not now as a servant, but above a servant as Christ Himself. Oh, bear in mind the message of this epistle. Onesimus always belonged to Philemon. Tell me, where did Christians ever get the idea that human beings didn't belong to anybody and they made the, the choice to go with with Satan or, or go with God. When the Scriptures make it very clear that we were always God's. We were always His. Ever since I was a little boy, I've heard Bible teachers and ministers wrestle with Peter. You know, you, you've returned unto the bishop and the shepherd of your soul. Returned. Key word. And I, you know, I'd say when I was 15 years old, why, why doesn't that say I always belong to Him? Always. I was always His. Onesimus always belonged to Philemon. But, but, oh, look at the difference. Not now by law, but by grace He bought me. Sin was a terrible devastation. By one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for they, they all sinned. And I believe God has every right to declare that. What a mess my servant is now under the penalty of death. God loved me. He so loved me that He gave His only begotten Son to die in my place. 
Am I to believe, as I, as I hear and as I read on in this epistle, that Philemon really didn't care much about Onesimus? If Onesimus came back, he, he's just going to kill him. That Onesimus was just a piece of property. Philemon could do anything he wanted to do with Onesimus. I believe that the whole entire epistle mitigates against that argument. Don't you recognize that you could have a slave that you love? And when that, when that slave, when that one breaks a law, which by the laws of the land puts him under the penalty of death and a broken heart to fulfill the law, so God prayed, He paid the price. He paid it. He paid it in full. Christ died in my place. Receive Him as myself. For He has been made the righteousness of God in Christ. What a wonderful epistle. In verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay. I'll repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee, how thou dost owe unto me even thine own self besides. What am I going to do with that? Listen, when Christ died in your place, He bought back for the deity that which belonged to the deity. Can you possibly imagine the obligation that exists between the deity and the incarnation? We, we all know what Christ said. Christ said, He came to do thy will, not my will. Not my will. To do the will of Him that sent me, and I finished the work that you gave me to do, is what He said. God, my Father, owned me. And now I am under the righteous penalty of death, and the only option is to die or pay the price. And so God becomes incarnate in human flesh, and dies in my place in order that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. This is basically the message of the gospel that we're looking at in, in a real historical account between Onesimus and Philemon and Paul. And, and so now he can receive me, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. No man can condemn me. No man can charge me. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. If you're going to condemn me before God, you must say that Christ didn't do enough. That His work was insufficient. That there's work left still to be done. Think of the obligation that now exists between the incarnation and the deity. And I believe there's a, there's a touch on that obligation. In verse 19, you say, you, it's simple language. I say the, obligations, the obligation is indescribable. It can only be alluded to. When I paid the price, I bought back that which was yours. I didn't do, I didn't do my will, says the incarnate, uh, incarnate Christ. I came and I did the will of Him that sent me. Did I do it satisfactorily? Well, obviously He rose from the dead. He was delivered because of our offenses, says the text. And He was raised because we were made righteous. If we had been made righteous, He could not have raised from the dead. That's Romans 4.25. If we hadn't been made righteous, Christ could not have risen from the dead. There would be no Easter. Think of that obligation. I say, I say, you owe me even your own self. Beside, I bought, I bought back everything that was yours. I don't, I don't know how to put this into words. God has an obligation. God has an obligation to receive you as Christ Himself because of the price paid on Calvary. If God does not receive you as Christ, then God is unfaithful to His Word and to His obligation. If Christ came and did what God the Father willed to be done, 
and purchased back, that's redeem, those who belong to him, all that, that are my, all that are mine are thine, and all thine are mine, showing the completeness, the perfectness of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 20. Verse 20. I recognize the human language, of course. Yes, brother, let me have joy of you in the Lord. Refresh me in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. That's, that's basically what the text says. Listen, God is not your buddy. He's not your pal, okay? I mean, like if you treat Him right and you do nice things, He'll do, he'll do great things for you. Like, kind of like, I've, as I've pointed out in the past, like a genie in the bottle. You know, you just stroke it just right and you get anything that you want. That's not God. There is a family relationship. We are no longer just God's possession. We are members of His family. And, and words like father and brother and son and sister become words that are fraught with meaning when viewed in light of the finished work of Jesus Christ. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Dearly beloved, was the, was the price that was paid, was it sufficient? Is, is that separation still there? Is that forsaking something? Is that, you know, of alarm? No. Now it's brother, father, friend, and, and once again, in the very language, we have an assurance of the Holy Spirit that what Christ did is sufficient. Refresh my heart in the Lord, or refresh my heart in Christ. Let me have joy of Thee. Make me happy. Make me happy in the Lord. How can we read that verse and not remember for, or think about the, the joy that was set before Him he, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His work is finished. And I, wish so, I, I so wish many more, more Christians understood this. I don't know what the joy was that, that was set before Christ. Surely some of it must have been to do the will of the Father, but some of it must have been me. And you, and in this verse, I can't help but realize there is, there is there also an indication of the great joy in heaven because one sheep has been found and returned to the fold. I'm not certain that, that we experience or we sense the same measure of joy that we should. There is a majesty, there, there is, is a miracle, there is a marvel in our relationship to God. How wonderful it must be to God the Father to realize that the sin question has been settled completely, permanently, forever, for all, all of His children. We have indications throughout this book of the joy that exists in glory. And it always excites me that that joy deals more with our relationship to God than it does with the, I don't know, the collapse of communism, the de defeating of ISIS, or, or whether or not there's world peace or, or you know, or any of, any of those great problems that we wrestle with here. That, that, to think of it, folks, that you are the central theme of glory, that God's great rejoicing is over your relationship to Him and over your redemption. Where we, we put such a high priority on other things. And I praise God that there is joy when I see Christ on the cross, when I see Him buried and I realized that He rose from the dead. 
But it takes verses like this for me to recognize what a joyous reunion there must have been when Christ rose from the dead. Imagine the difference between my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the great gulf that exists between that and the oneness of the incarnation and the deity, Christ risen from the dead, seated at the right hand of the, of the majesty on high. I see, I, I see some of that in the account of the prodigal son. You know, my son who is dead is alive again. I recognize there can be in that picture of redemption uh, in that, a picture of redemption, but it must also indicate some of the joy that must have been there when he, when he who knew no sin had been made sin for me. Somehow we want to avoid the fact that Christ was made sin, but He was. And He who had been with the Father, glorified with the Father from, from be before the world began, was now made sin for me, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Oh, the joy in the Father's heart and in the Son's heart when the Incarnation stands at the right hand of God the Father. And then verse 21, I'll, I'll read it in the authorized version, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee knowing that thou, thou wilt also do more than I say. Now, that's a simple verse. And those are simple words. I don't know what translation you're, you're using or what translation uh, your translation says there having confidence in thy compliance. I think the word obedience is not an improper translation. They had every right to do that because the Holy Spirit has had Paul write some of, of these uh, in, in, in the imperative mood, imperatives, the mood of command. All sin is forgiven in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me have joy of thee. Refresh my heart in the Lord. I will repay it. If he's wronged you, put that on my account. That's a command. Put that on my account. And he had every right to say that. And I believe that though Paul may not have had as much right as the message of the epistle has, Christ has every right to say it. Therefore, the, the translators have put obedience in verse 21. Since there's a command, then he anticipates obedience, it seems to me, in the sense of the epistle and in the area of grace. I, I, I like the, the word compliance better. And it's a perfectly good translation of the Greek. Compliance. Having confidence in thy compliance or obedience. Having confidence. The word pytho in the Greek means to be persuaded by. And I am uh, persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Dearly beloved, do we have that kind of confidence? Being confident of this very thing, being confident of this very thing, that He who hath begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, but we run our lives more in the area of possibility and probability and, and chance than than we do in dogma, dogmatism. In fact, one of the great criticisms of many, many people is that, well, you know, they're, they're too dogmatic. 
Steve, you're being too dogmatic. N Listen, nobody is more dogmatic than God Almighty. Hoping that he who began a good work in you may feel inclined to finish it. <laughs> what a terrible verse of Scripture that'd be. He always causes you to triumph, folks. If you're listening to this, listen to me. If you are a believer in Christ, He always causes you to triumph. Well, you say that obviously is not true because most of the time I don't triumph, Steve. Now the trouble is I don't understand the great conflict between flesh and spirit. The new man always triumphs. Or God's a liar. He says He always gives us the victory. What a comforting truth. He will complete that which He started. He will keep that which is committed unto Him. There's that high level of confidence that ought to be the foundation of every Christian's walk. But sadly, it's not. Sadly, it's not. It's amazing to me, how few people have very much confidence in Christ. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of Christians out there, but there really aren't a lot of people that I run into who are highly confident that they are one with Christ. And to know that is to love Him more. To recognize the extent of what He did. That is our motivating factor, folks. It's not law. We are constrained by love, not law. Having confidence in thy compliance. What we're saying is we know that God's going to do what He said He'd do. He's going to do it. There isn't any doubt. There isn't any possibility that it will not happen. God will do what He said He's going to do. I'm so thankful for that confidence and that assurance that comes through Christ. Why should Christ mediate for me if there isn't any possibility of success? I wrote unto you knowing. That knowing is a perfect in the Greek, perfect tense. Knowing in past time with the absolute result that I perfectly now know in the present. That you will do more than I say. And that verse, I believe, has been used more than any verse in pr probably any verse in all of the Greek New Testament is, a, is an argument against slavery. That what that verse is saying in, in, in kind language and in tactful speech is that Philemon ought to set Onesimus free. Now, whether or not in history Philemon set Onesimus free or not, I, I have no idea. And whether or not the Holy Spirit is, is telling Onesimus or Philemon to do that through Paul, I don't know. What I do know, what I do know, is that God has done more than we could ask or think far beyond our comprehension, anything that we might ask for. You know, Israel never asked to be redeemed out of the land of Egypt. But God did it. He did it. And He's done more than we could ask or think. Now, the perfect tense indicates that Christ has absolute confidence in His mediation. And that confidence has to be part of our experience also. If we're to really understand what God has done for us. Do more than I say, says the text. Verse 22. With all prepare me a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. I should be given unto you. You know, we could spend a lot of time talking about Paul in prison. The Roman law says that you could be, well, it basically said that you could be charged with a crime and placed in jail. And then those who charged you 
they, they had to come forward. They must come and, and substantiate that charge. They've got two years in which to do that. They had two years in which to do that. And if they didn't do that, if they did not bring the charge, if they did not cause it to come to trial within two years, no matter the crime, didn't matter what the crime was, the prisoner has to be set free. That was Roman law. Now, there are those who argue, well, what that verse says is, is Paul's been in prison about two years in Rome and, and nobody's brought any charges against him. None of those Jews came from Rome to substantiate any charge against him. And therefore, he anticipates being set free. And maybe he was. A lot of people believe he was. I've got to tell you, I don't know. First of all, I see in the verse a confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ in His being made sin for us, that He will rise from the dead. Let this cup pass from me, He said. Here we have an insight into the, into the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. Steve, he, he, did, he wanted to avoid the cross. Really? Uh, the one who became incarnate for the joy set before him, who, the one who came to do the will of the Father, now at the last minute, he don't want to do it. Is that what you're telling me? Because if that be so, then he sinned. If that be so, he's imperfect. If, if, that, if, if he's imperfect, I'm not redeemed. And the whole basis of theology collapses like a stack of cards, like a house of cards or whatever. If Christ didn't know God's will, then what in the world did he come to do? What he said was, let the, the cup I am now drinking come to an end. That's what he was saying. And it did. And so first of all, I see in the verse his confidence that he's going to return to the deity, that the incarnation is going to rise from the dead and return to the deity. I believe also in the verse is the promise, the blessed promise that he's going to come again He's going to return and take us unto Himself. I love you all. I truly do. My prayer for you all is, is constant. And that prayer primarily consists of one thing. And that, that is you would let the truth of His Word guide your life. Every decision. I've, I've, always, I've said this before. I believe that, that with all, all of my heart, I believe that theological error precedes moral error. And, and just the opposite of that is true. Sanctify them in truth, He said. Thy word is truth. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.